5, verse 3. We'll read verses 1 through 3. Uh, Gospel of Matthew, I'm reading in the English Standard Version. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and now we ask the Lord, just because, O oh, Heavenly Father, we confess that we are just like those sheep that the scripture says are so prone to wander. We all have, like sheep, gone astray. We've gone astray this week in, in I don't know how many ways. We've looked for grass that is not what you provided for us, and we've gone elsewhere looking for, for what is attractive to us, what is appetizing to us. We've neglected the voice of our shepherd and, and turned our ear away. We've gone on our own will and just wandered off in, in ways that seemed right to us. Father, in these and countless other ways, we sin against you all the time. And yet you are holy and good and righteous, as we've been reminded this morning. And so we come to you as a people, and we confess our sin before you now. And we ask, O Holy Father, by your great mercy and loving kindness, would you give us your word to restore in our hearts faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, that we would know that forgiveness that we were just singing about, faith in Jesus as the one through whom sinners are brought and reconciled to God Almighty. We ask this by a movement of your grace, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and in the name of Jesus we ask, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated as we take up an offering. I have been forgetting that in recent weeks, but it's an important thing to do, to continue to do. Uh, giving to the Lord is an act of worship. If, if you are a regular part of our church, we're grateful for your continued gen generosity and support of the ministry. If you're a visitor with us, don't think twice about it. Just visit, visit, you, don't, you don't need to give. Don't feel obligated to give. We're just glad you're here. And if you're online or at home uh, joining us online, please don't, re don't forget your giving at bcchurch.ca slash giving. There is instructions there for how you can contribute. There was once a man named Simon. He was born Simon, as far as we know. But to his friends and to those who asked, he said, you know, I really prefer that you call me Simon the Great. Simon the Great. In fact, it, where we read this from is in Acts chapter 8. And the text actually suggests that his name is something like, you know, Mega Man. It's, it's literally the Greek word mega plus, you know, someone who's mega. So mega someone or mega man. That's how he liked to tell, uh, how he liked to introduce himself to people. It says in Acts chapter 8 that he called himself someone great. Wow. The people where he lived paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, it says, saying and agreeing with him. This man is the power of God that is called great. And it says they paid attention to him because of all the, the magic he had done. He had entertained them or impressed them, not with tricks, but with actual magic, the text suggests. But then along came Philip, an evangelist, one of the early, I think a deacon in the church. And Philip uh, preached the gospel in that part of the country in Samaria and people believed it says that when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ they were baptized both men and women even Simon himself believed and after being baptized he continued with Philip and as he saw the signs and the miracles that God performed through the hands of Philip it says Simon was amazed. He was amazed by what he saw. It was nothing like his magic. The apostles heard about what was happening in Samaria, and so they sent Peter and John to go to Samaria and, and come there and pray for them that they, in this, the converts in Samaria, might also receive the Holy Spirit. 
So Peter and John traveled there, and it says that Peter and John laid hands on them after they had been baptized. They, they laid hands on them, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. They received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the apostles were laying hands on people, and then those people were receiving the Holy Spirit, Simon said, this is one of those times when you don't do what Simon says. But Simon said, Give me this power also, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money? You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God, said Peter. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see, Peter said, that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. And Simon answered, the only right answer Simon could possibly give in that situation, he said, pray for me to the Lord. Pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you've said may come upon me. Wow. Like Peter saw that Simon's heart was not right before God. The Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preaches in Matthew chapter 5 to 7. The Sermon on the Mount has a, a similar effect of, of weeding out pretend Christians. There's only one right response. is to pray. And ask the Lord's forgiveness. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warns, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's Matthew 7, verse, verse 21. Some people are going to complain, says Jesus. They're going to complain that they, they were involved in all kinds of Christian ministries, that they served the church in all kinds of ways, that they, they regularly gave their offering or, or whatever it is. They, they did all kinds of things in his name. And on the last day, Jesus says, I will say to them, I depart from me. I never knew you. But on the Sermon on the Mount, the words of Jesus begin with a blessing, a blessing often called Beatitudes. A description of the kinds of people Jesus will allow into his kingdom. The Beatitudes. They give a profile of kingdom citizens, what kingdom people are like. What, what kingdom people must be like, must be like now, in order to enter the kingdom of God. But we have to, we have to admit, even as we just read verse 3, that the standard that Jesus gives for what kingdom people must be like is an impossible standard. Nobody except Jesus can measure that. To the profile of the citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Starting with this beatitude in verse 3. This beatitude that is foundational to everything that follows. This is the starting point. This is the first building block. This is the very original prerequisite. Without which you will never be accepted by God. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So the sermon begins with Jesus telling his disciples who gets to be part of the kingdom of heaven. And the sermon ends in Matthew chapter 7 with Jesus warning presumptuous people who thought that they were Christians that they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. The standard is impossible. The Sermon on the Mount weeds us all out. Exposes all of us. For where we pretend, where our hearts, like Simon the Great, where our hearts are not right before God. And verse 3 shows that 
all of our hearts are not right before God. I should say, put, put it the other way, shouldn't I? Verse 3 shows us that none of our hearts are, are right before God. But I don't want you to leave yet. I'd like you to stay put, stay seated for the, for the next, you know, 30 minutes or so as we see where this is going to take us. Just because you can't meet the standard doesn't mean that there's not a way. So the first blessing Jesus grants in, in verse 3 of the Beatitudes, the first blessing from Jesus grants his approval to those who know that they have nothing to offer him in return. I want to leave you this morning on a very little exposition of a very little passage. Verse 3 of Matthew chapter 5. And I want to take this in two parts. First, the, what Jesus promises is just simply the promise. What Jesus promises. We'll take that in two parts, looking at the blessing and the kingdom. But secondly, the people to whom he promises it. Who Jesus promises it to. So first, what Jesus promises here in verse 3. And very simply, Jesus promises a blessing, doesn't he? Look with me at that verse again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He does that seven or eight times more in this uh, short passage about the Beatitudes, giving a blessing. So I, I think it's really important that we start this morning just by clarifying and being very clear, what is a blessing? What does this mean that Jesus said, blessed are, seven or eight times, nine times if you count the last one? What does this mean, a blessing, a biblical blessing? See, a, a biblical blessing isn't like the way we often think about blessing. You know, there's an emoji. I, I installed Bitmoji on my phone because I love the cartoon pictures in all kinds of circumstances and situations. There's the right one to express your feeling, and so I use it all the time. My family tells me somebody has to take my phone away. Uh, but uh, there's one for when you feel blessed. There, there's a, it's got a little halo and you're looking happy and it's when you're feeling blessed. And that's clearly not what Jesus is talking about, right? That's what the world thinks about being blessed. That's not what Jesus had in mind. Just look at verse 10 and 11. Uh, it, blessed are you feeling blessed emoji, when you're persecuted. Verse 11, when others revile you. Reviling you seems to be just about the worst thing you can do to a, a fellow Canadian under Canadian law these days. Blessed are you, I'm feeling blessed. That is not what Jesus meant. You might think of a blessing as what a man asks for when he nervously asks the father of a woman he loves for his blessing on their union, on their marriage, which I was very happy recently to give. That's a blessing. In the Bible, people bless people. In the Bible, people bless God. And in the Bible, God blesses people. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God blessed them. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. Throughout the Bible, the word blessed, it, it does, it means happy, but it means more than that. Our word happy just doesn't cut it. It means more than just happy. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament says that what's special about this word in the New Testament, this word for blessed in the New Testament, is that it's about a joy that people have if they have a share in the kingdom of God. If they've got a, a, a they know, they've got a reason to know that they have an inheritance in the kingdom of God. That no matter what happens right now, if they have a reason, a legal reason to know that they are assured that they will participate in the kingdom of God. The theological dictionary of the New Testament says that that word blessed describes that kind of person. Dr. Don Carson says, therefore, that to be blessed is to have God's approval, to be accepted by God, even in times of suffering and in times of loss and in times of grief, even while we are suffering, even while we are losing, even while we are grieving. 
If we have God's blessing, it means we, have, we know there's a reason that we can count on by which we can be assured that we will participate in the kingdom of heaven, even that already we have a share in the kingdom of heaven even now. A reason for joy that nothing on earth can shake loose if we have God's blessing, His approval, His acceptance. That of the Creator Himself. So have a look with me at verse 3 again. Notice in the middle of verse 3, there's that little word, for. It says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That word for, F-O-R, also could mean because, or since, or something like that. Jesus is stating that the reason why these people are blessed, the reason they know that they are blessed, he says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They have a share in God's kingdom. What if they lose their job? They have God's kingdom. What if they lose a loved one to cancer? They have God's kingdom. What if they lose a child? They still have God's kingdom. What if they lose their health or their retirement savings or if the one they love breaks up with them or if, what if they are wrong? What if they are mistreated? What if they are abused? They have God's kingdom. No matter what happens to us here, nothing can take that away if it was given by God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says they are blessed because of that. If there was ever an expert, I may not know the suffering that you've been through. I may not know the losses you've experienced. I may not know the tragedy that you've endured. But if there was ever an expert, when it comes to suffering and being mistreated and losing, I mean experiencing loss, it was Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrow, said the prophet Isaiah, and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not, Isaiah 53. And that should remind you, that prophecy about Jesus should remind you that he is not being flippant with this blessing. He's not being trite and superficial with this blessing. He knows what he's talking about. His sorrows were greater than yours. But so was his joy. This is the Lord who said in John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is he who Hebrews 12, 2 says, is the founder and perfecter of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God in Hebrews 12, 2. Whoever follows Jesus is going to be guaranteed a share of his sufferings now, but is also promised an inheritance in his blessing, in his kingdom. In verse 3, Jesus is saying that they can share his joy, his happiness, his blessing, the approval and acceptance he enjoys because of God his Father. He, we, they can share that joy, happiness, blessing now because they have a share in his kingdom. They have a part. They have an inheritance. They belong. And no one can change that. No one on earth can change. Let me change gears a little. That's the kingdom. What about the king? Matthew's presented Jesus in the first four chapters of this gospel 
as the true king, the son of God, one whose birth was even announced in the stars, not just in the classifieds of the newspaper. The one John the Baptist called the Spirit, or well called the Lord and Yahweh. This is, this is him. The one who John said would baptize people with the Holy Spirit, whose sandals, the greatest prophet in the history of Israel, said, I'm not even worthy to carry. This is him. The one who is coming, John the Baptist preached, to gather his wheat into his bar barn, to, but to burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is him. So what? Why should that matter? It matters a great deal about who is giving the blessing. When Mark asked me for my blessing, it matters that he was asking me. A little. It matters a little what he was asking me. Not someone else, not the neighbor down the street. Hey dude, Bob, what, your name's Bob? That girl over there, would you give me your blessing to marry her? His blessing's irrelevant. But when I gave my blessing to Mark, and I don't want to embarrass Mark too much. <laughs> when I gave my blessing to Mark, it meant I was accepting him. So he can even spend like holiday dinners with our family. He, he doesn't even have to knock on the door anymore. He can just walk right in and sit with us at table. It matters entirely who gives the blessing. This blessing comes from none other than the Lord, the King of Heaven, God the Son. So what is he promising? What is the kingdom of heaven like? What is it? The Jews were, were really familiar with the, the idea of the kingdom of God. That was a well-known idea, a very common idea. The Bible uses that phrase, the kingdom of God, 67 times. But the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, it's only found in Matthew's gospel. It's particular to Jesus here and particular to, to what Matthew is focusing on of Jesus' teaching. It was a unique way Jesus had of describing God's kingdom in order to, to distinguish it from what many people had in mind. Lots of people thought God would make Israel a great kingdom again and give them victory over the Romans and make them another empire like they had been once upon a time. But Jesus keeps saying, no, no, the kingdom is from heaven, not from earth. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's not a kingdom you can fabricate, you can produce. It's from heaven. It's supernatural. It's not going to be anything like all the other kingdoms on earth or the kingdoms you've enjoyed before. Because it was primarily spiritual. That's what Martin Lloyd-Jones said about it. He said, it's the sphere and the realm in which Jesus is king. Wherever it, wherever Jesus is ruling so that whatever is ruled is underneath his authority, underneath his kingship, underneath his reign, that's the kingdom of heaven. And in the Bible, we find that because true Christians are already now under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, they already now belong to this kingdom. The kingdom's already here, in a sense. And so Paul writes, that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I love the way Paul writes that. To the kingdom of his beloved son. Colossians 1.13. And Paul says that our citizenship is where? In heaven. Our citizenship now is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Philippians 3.20 and on. And John says in the book of Revelation that Jesus loves us and has freed us from our sins by His blood and made us a kingdom. Now! Priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Revelation 1 verse 5 and 6. And then just a few verses later. 
John can't help thinking about this kingdom, still in chapter 1 of Revelation. And he says, he describes his, to his readers that he is their brother and partner in the tribulation. Yes, now, the trials, the suffering, the persecution, yes, I'm sharing it with you, John is saying. But also in the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And the patient endurance that are in Jesus, Revelation 1.9. See, the New Testament, therefore, it, it describes the kingdom as already existing. Wherever people live in submission to Jesus, as something to which they already belong, and which they will enter physically after they're raised from the dead at the return of Jesus Christ. It's all that. Already present, where believers' hearts are, are right before God, it's already here, the kingdom. Submitted to Jesus. And the kingdom is also still coming. It's still coming. It's not fully here yet. Not yet fully arrived. Because in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, Paul is so clear and is wonderfully clear that the kingdom of God is something that the unrighteous will not inherit. He says, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I don't think that's a comprehensive list. I think it's a suggestive list. There are lots of people. Any kind of sinner will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul connects the kingdom of God with the resurrection of the dead that's still future. The resurrection of those who belong to Jesus Christ when he comes again. And Paul says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's not just sinners. Natural people can't inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and bones of ours, these ones that grew up from our DNA that we got from our parents. These things can't inherit the kingdom of God. There's no room for it there. There's no access for these bodies of ours there in that kingdom. Not because that kingdom is all spiritual and ghost-like and ephemeral and ethereal, but because that kingdom is too solid, too real, and these bodies aren't real enough. That's what C.S. Lewis said. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall all be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. You see, it's got to be more real, more solid, more lasting, more permanent than these bodies are that are growing old and fat and sloppy, with the hair falling out and growing in all the wrong places. And this mortal body must put on immortality. That's the kind of kingdom we're talking about. Lloyd-Jones is exactly right. He's on the money when he concludes, it has come, it is coming, it is to come. It was here when Christ was exercising authority. In the Gospels, we read that. It is here in us now when we are submitted to Jesus. It is yet to come. It will come when this rule and reign of Christ will be established over the whole world, even in a physical and material sense. The day is coming when the kingdoms of this world will have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. It will then have come completely, entirely, and everything will be under his dominion and sway. That's why so many people in every single church around the world, in every single community around the world, no matter how spiritual or religious or what nice people they are, cannot inherit the kingdom. Not the sexually immoral, not thieves or greedy or drunkards or verbal abusers or cheaters or adulterers. No sinner of any kind 
can inherit the kingdom of God in that future because everything will be under his sway and dominion. So then I think we're ready. Now having said a little bit about the blessing and a little bit about the kingdom, the promise of Christ. We're ready to say that the blessing Jesus promises to certain people in verse 3. It's the approval of the king from heaven so that on the day of his return, he pledges, he, he gives that blessing. It's, a, it's an assurance of acceptance and approval by him on account of, on behalf of God. He's pledging to raise these people from the dead and bring them with him into his physical and material kingdom one day over the whole world. And on that day, the kingdom of God will fill every realm and every sphere of heaven and earth. But right now, it's mainly spiritual. Therefore, the most important question we could ask, the most important thing we should be thinking about right now is not what we're having for lunch. It is what do I need to do to get Jesus to approve of me? Or in other words, what must I do for God to accept me? Or in other words, how can I get this blessing from Jesus? And that brings us to the question of the people to whom Jesus promises this blessing. Who Jesus promises it to? That's my second point in this two point one verse sermon. Who Jesus promises it to? Look at verse 3 again. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me say first, just because there's some political nonsense that floats around and is justified because of this verse, that, that Christians you know, cannot use this as a way to say that, that followers of Christ shouldn't have money. This has nothing to do with your personal bank account. Being poor by itself is no virtue. If you've ever been poor, you know that. Jesus doesn't say here, blessed are the poor. He does say that elsewhere, but even the context there in Luke suggests that he's talking about something else. Jesus says here, blessed are the poor in spirit. So in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. And that's talking about something very different from a lack of money, isn't it? The same word for poor is used in Psalm 69, 32 in the Greek translation to say, when the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. That was the translated as humble in that verse. And in Isaiah 29, verse 19, again, the Greek translation, it says, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord. And that word translated meek is the same word here for poor. The meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exalt in the Holy One of Israel, Isaiah 29, 19. So that kind of poverty is not about what's in your pocket, it's about what's in your heart. The condition of your heart. And then Jesus said, in spirit, poor in spirit. And that, that little phrase there, in spirit, is pretty common in the Bible, it occurs all kinds of places. Psalm 34, 18 says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Acts 18, 25 says, Apollos was fervent in spirit. Romans 12, 11, Paul instructs believers, Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. In other words, don't just have a zeal that you can stir up and manufacture within you. Don't just have a zeal that comes from your emotions or from natural causes, but a zeal in your spirit that comes from spiritual causes. Likewise, Jesus is saying that the only people who will ever be part of his kingdom are those who are poor in their spiritual condition as a result of spiritual causes. I, I doubt anything could be more totally alien or foreign to our culture today than this. But we've had, you know, what is it? I, I don't know, 60, 70 years of, of like advertising, 
television and radio telling us the kinds of people we should be, the kinds of people we can be, if only you will buy this. Social media has made this much, much, much worse. But there's a spirit of the age also that people are just accepting. It's like they're drunk with this idea of self-image and projecting yourself and exposing, not exposing yourself, but, you know, like, uh, uh, dis displaying who you really are, letting people see the real you. Can you imagine a high school guidance counselor telling teenagers this? Oh, guys, your self-esteem is bogus. Not only are you not special or interesting, you've really got nothing to offer the world. In fact, you have no internal spiritual value at all. You're spiritually bankrupt. Can you imagine a high school guidance counselor telling students that the parents, imagine the parents' reaction, that we can imagine. You told my baby, what? They get him fired in short order, right? But isn't this essentially what Jesus said to that church in Laodicea? In the beginning of the book of Revelation, the city that was famous for its economy, for its, its fine clothes, for its medicine, Jesus said, I will spit you out of my mouth, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, Jesus said. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. He's talking about real riches, spiritual riches. That you may buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourself. These are the people famous for their white linens. I think it was linens. It's not talking about being covered physically, being covered spiritually. He says, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And to buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. People who are famous for making salve, some kind of medicine. Jesus is not talking about curing their bodies, but curing their spiritual condition. All of this means that when Jesus promises to accept and bless, blessed are, in verse 3. When he promises to accept and bless those who confess their spiritual poverty, it's because he has everything you need. You are weak. He is omnipotent, all-powerful. You are dying. He is the creator and sustainer of life. You are sinful. He is righteous and holy altogether. You are needy. He is merciful and kind and gracious. God needs nothing from you or from anyone. He's God. He is all sufficient in himself and by himself. But you need everything from God. You need God. That's why I said don't get up and leave just when you hear that this verse 3 sets an impossible standard for entrance into the kingdom. You need God. And his name is Jesus. That's where we need to start. That's why this beatitude comes at the beginning of all the rest. And all the rest of the descriptions of kingdom people and the Sermon on the Mount. We need to start here. We need to start first by getting our hearts right with God. For the first time. And for the hundredth time or the millionth time or however many often times you've had to repent and say, God, my heart is not right. I'm proud. I forgot how much I need you, Lord. Remember Jesus' mother, Mary? On Christmas Eve, we watched that movie about her, Heather and her parents. We watched the Nativity Story, the one, I think, starring Oscar Isaac in 2004, 2005 or something. I don't know. I love that movie. I, I love the portrayal. Much of it is uh, close to the biblical account, and I appreciate that. 
But after the angel told Mary that she was going to bear the Son of God and that her relative Elizabeth, miraculously in her old age, was also pregnant, Mary, acts, uh, rather Luke one thirty nine says that Mary went to visit Elizabeth and Judah. And when Mary gets there, she entered the house and she called out. And at the sound of her voice, Elizabeth started. She jumped. She turns around and she says, Elizabeth says, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Okay, what the rest of the world saw was a pregnant teenage girl. But for spiritual causes, a spiritual condition now existed in Elizabeth's heart. And she said, why is it granted to me? That the mother of my Lord should come to me. That's poor in spirit. Then there's Mary herself. She praised God, saying, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices within me. In God my Savior, she says, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. He has looked. The humble estate of his servant, Mary said. That's poor in spirit. Those two women, two women that rightfully, I think, biblically should be considered honored above all other women in human history. The one who bore our Lord and the one who heralded his coming. Two women honored more than any other in history. Completely astonished by God's grace to them. Completely undeserving, and they knew it. And they freely admitted it. So different from Simon, the great. Please, don't call me Simon. Call me the great one. Call me Mega Man. <laughs> so different. Even Simon will ask for prayer, didn't he? Most of us are going to have to repent of the kind of this, this pride of self-sufficiency many, many, many times before the kingdom comes. All the time. Every day. Every day. I'm sure Mary and Elizabeth did too. <laughs> they were poor in spirit then. What about a few years later when things were going great? When they forgot how much they needed God and how little they had to give God. See, pride in spirit is natural. Poor in spirit isn't. It's spiritual. It's a spiritual condition. You can't make this from a natural cause. Not a mental condition, not a physical condition. Poor in spirit is not something that you can produce or make happen. It's not something produced in you by anything natural at all or worldly, is not going to be found in other people outside of the Christian church. People who are not followers of Christ. They will never be poor in spirit, and neither will we, naturally. It is a spiritual condition that only comes from an encounter with God. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones again says, It is just this tremendous awareness of our utter nothingness as we come face to face with God. That is to be poor in spirit. So what do we need then? We need the constant, regular, at least weekly preaching of God's word to show us God again. To remind us how wealthy he is in himself and how poor we are in ourselves. We need to see God more often. We need to be more aware continually of who he is and who we are therefore before him. Not wrong in the heart like Simon the Great, but right in the heart like Mary and Elizabeth. So we need that we're preaching of God's word as often as we can get it to remind us. Oh, you forgot? You, you forgot where your talents, where your abilities, where your great personality, where your intelligence comes from, where your money comes from, where it all comes from, you forgot? You thought you could obtain the gift of God with money, Peter said to Simon. 
You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God, Peter said to Simon in Acts 8, 20. Well, Isaiah said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? What is the place of my rest? All these things I have made with my hands. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. There's another way of saying all this. It's just this. When you come to Jesus, you have nothing in yourself to offer him. Nothing to boast about before him. Nothing but need that only he can supply. But when you come with those empty hands, and empty to pride, and simply say, Lord, be gracious to me. King Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you because you are poor in spirit. My kingdom is yours. Let's pray. Father, we confess our pride. Over the holidays, perhaps, surrounded by friends and family and turkey meals and decorations, we forgot how much we need you. We forgot that what we experienced by way of now of earthly comforts is nothing to do with the state of our souls before you. In fact, we could lie about our actual spiritual condition. But the same thing is true, Lord, when we, when we know and, and we experience all lack. And we feel like we're constantly going without. And we feel like others have it better than we do. And we feel like, shouldn't it be our turn now to experience some of what they have? Lord, what our hearts need is not to be filled by this world but to have our needs met in you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Would you teach us again to admit and confess the poverty of our spirit, that we might find the only one who is all the supply we will ever need, that in Jesus Christ alone. And Lord, as he supplies our need, no matter what our circumstances now, while we wait for his kingdom, as he supplies all that we need in himself, and that he is that for us. And that we draw on that grace and we are comforted by his presence. And we are made alive by hope in him. We find and experience the freedom of forgiveness of sin because of his cross. Lord, would you magnify and glorify your son Jesus Christ by our need for him. Show that he is all sufficient. Lord. Bless your son, Father, we ask. Your beloved son in whose kingdom you have transferred us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.